Marshallpreneur TV. It's me, Scott Patterson, and we're back with a brand new episode for you. And this week's special guest is Ian Abernethy. Now, Ian is best known for his work on the practical application of karate and kata bunkai, or application of the moves within kata for real combat. He's been a published author and has produced many books and training DVDs. He has a successful podcast, which I like to listen to regularly, which spurred me on to ask him to come onto the show. Ian produced a podcast episode in which he called Money in the Martial Arts, which I think every martialpreneur should listen to. It really is an important podcast. In our Martialpreneur TV episode, I expand upon that podcast Ian did and also ask Ian to guide us on how he went from an electrician to a full-time instructor and published author. This episode is a real cracker and it is absolute fried gold for anyone wishing to pursue a career as a full-time teacher in the martial arts. So before we go over to chat with Ian, I want to ask you if you have not already, like the Facebook page, sign up for our VIP newsletter on the website or spread the love by sharing these episodes with your peers and colleagues. If you have any questions about this episode or, or any questions for any of our guests, then let me know via email. My email is scott at marshallpreneur.tv. So without further ado, let's go see what Ian has to say. Okay, welcome to Marshallpreneur TV. We have our very special guest today. We have Ian Abernethy. How you doing, Ian? I'm very well, thank you. Hello, everyone. Hello, hello. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, Ian, I just uh, wanted to get you onto the show today because I'd like to talk about a bit about going full time as as an instructor, as a, a professional in the martial arts, and sort of uh, your views on that. I, I listened to your podcast on your website, which was fantastic about. Um, martial arts and money and sort of teaching money and those kinds of things. I thought, you know, it was a really uh, valuable, valuable Hi. thought there. So I just wanted to sort of get your views on that a little bit more and maybe elaborate that on a bit later as well. Um, but first of all, do you want to introduce yourself and, and just let people know a bit about yeah, you? Yeah, and... um, my name's obviously Dean Abernethy, uh, live in Cumbria in England. I've been involved in the martial arts for nearly 30 years. I've been full time for round about the last decade now um, uh, with them. I predominantly focus on like the self defence based stuff, practical application of cutters. Uh, I don't really have a, a, a like a dojo as such. I, I kind of travel teaching and I make uh, most of my income through um, that, and then obviously books and DVDs and things. And I have a website, obviously, that people can check out to learn more about me you know so it's ianabernethy.com absolutely oh, awesome i mean ian how did how did uh, you get into martial arts what was like the story of ian where, where did it first um you know happen for yeah. you yeah well it was one of those things i think like um i'd always had an interest in it but in kind of in the same way that you know every kid wants to be batman or spider-man or something like <laughs> yeah. that martial arts are, are one way that you know you can become that kind of superhero type type character i guess yeah um, but then uh, there was a few things that kind of happened. One was uh, consistently getting into fights at school was one one problem, and then the other one was uh, I uh, it was Enter the Dragon aired on the TV. <laughs> so it was a case of uh, you know watching Enter the Dragon, deciding you know fighting is something I should really be good at, and then that was what forced me. Because I had loads of books on martial arts before I, I, I took it up. I've yeah. always been, um, a prolific reader, so I had uh, lots of kind of you know books on on things, and then. But never really practiced it, and then Bruce Lee comes on the TV, swings his nunchucks about. And okay, yeah. you know, I'm, in, I'm, I'm sold. Yeah, <laughs> he's got a lot to answer for, Bruce Lee, isn't he? Yeah, he has. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I, um, I started uh, training in karate not long, long after that, and um, been there ever since. Oh, fantastic. So, um, you know, what I, I wanted to elaborate, as I said earlier, uh, with yourself, Ian, is, is how did that you make that transition into sort of them from obviously your passion. Um, and then to go into um, taking it as a career because I know a lot of uh, our viewers uh, might even be um, just students and maybe looking to teach or maybe be teachers but looking to go full time rather than being just doing it on the side part time. Um, how did you make that transition? What what was the the steps that that you um, started that road really? Yeah, it was it was a long process. So right. um, like for, for just to, and I'm not saying necessarily what I did is the ultimate way or the yeah, healthiest sure. way to do it but this is so when i was um 16 i took on a, an apprenticeship uh being an electrician right and the main reason i took on that apprenticeship was it would allow me to earn a reasonable living and still carry on training in the martial arts that way i wanted to it was always a long time goal since i was you know in my teens right uh, i then um 
many years later, um, I, I'd obviously the karate was a passion. That's what I was focused upon. Again, I del- avoided promotions. I didn't do qualifications I, just because this was what I wanted to spend all my time doing. Sure. Then uh, about 10 or so years ago, um, actually it'll be more than that now. It'll be nearly kind of 15 years ago. Um, what I decided was that um, this is something that I, I wanted to be able to devote my time to fully. Right. And having to earn a living was getting in the way of that. Right. <laughs> um, I'd start. I'd already written a few books. Um, a couple of my uh, there was videos back then. You know, VHSs before DVDs. Big tapes. Yeah, no, that's exactly it. Yeah, yeah. Well, I must prefer a DVD. Then I have got them piled up in you know corners. But, uh, I decided that uh, that's what I wanted to you know do. I wanted to go um, full time. Uh, I looked at the uh, bank balance and I worked out there was a, I think it was it was eight hundred pound a month shortfall. You know, right. so. Uh, I spoke to Jeff Thompson saying, you know, work's kind of getting in the way here now, you know, it's, um, but I'm not kind of at the position where I can fully support myself doing the martial arts and I'm not, you know, you so I'm kind of, so you can see the light at the end of the yeah, table, but I'm but, trapped, you know, yeah, yeah. And, and Jeff just basically said, well, you, you know what you need to do. You, you're just asking me for reassurance of what you've already decided to do. You know, you take the, the jump, you take the step. Uh, and that's what I, what I did. And it hasn't been without its, its challenges, but, but that was it. So I've been, I guess, you know, the things that work well for me is uh, I, I didn't do it overnight. You know, this is something I did over a, a long period of time. I decided that I, I didn't uh, – what I wanted to do was spend all my time doing martial arts. That was it. And in order to do that, I need to make a decent living from the martial arts to provide for my children, my family, everybody else, you know. Absolutely. Um, so I, I did it in a, in, a, in a kind of long and uh, measured process. And it was just that kind of last step that was the uh, – the tricky one, really. So, you know, if some guy's kind of like a 16-year-old first down and wants to go full-time, I would suggest he maybe wants to invest in his skills a little bit more before yeah, cool. the kind of, you know, the, the, the do that, you know. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. And likewise, you know, if, if you are the guy who's got these skills and knowledge and you're teaching part-time, you know, consider moving full-time. If that's your passion and that's your joy, yeah. um, you know, get out there and serve people and in the process do what, you know, you love doing, you know. And ramp it, ramp it up a bit and just try and make that transition go for it yeah yeah that's it well you've got to, you've got to have the kind of goal it, it doesn't i mean i got to the point where I, you know i just had that last bit to jump i'd already yeah. done the books i was writing in the magazines uh, uh i was you know the profile was not super high but high that i was on ra- the radar and that's when i made the step yeah it would have been foolish of me to make the jump at 16 yeah and <laughs> you know i'll kind of work from there because you need the income coming in you sure see, so. sure absolutely you know we all need to live and you know you've got to keep the roof over your house over your head and, and that kind of thing but um so with the talks about the books there and i've got a I've got a copy here of <laughs> it's what, i bought this quite a while back and you know fantastic fantastic reading anyone who's, who's interested in ian's martial arts stuff and and anyone in in karate, in my opinion, should read this. You know, if you practice kata, then you got to read that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, how did that? How did that come about? I mean, it's a decent book as well, and, and you know, writing. You know, it's something I find very hard is is writing, and um, you know, I'm okay in front of the camera or recording that kind of thing, but um, writing, I, I struggle. So, how how did that start with you? I know you said earlier that you were a prolific reader, so uh, yeah, that helped. Yeah, no, that's it. I mean, I love books, you know. So the, yeah. the, one of the life ambitions was always to uh, write a book. I probably spend, in terms of my personal treats for myself, right. I spend more on books than anything else. Right. You can't really see because of the way the camera's angled, but out of shot, and that's why I've moved the camera this way. These books literally from the floor to the seat. <laughs> right, yeah. So it, it, it looks really messy, and, you know, so I've kind of twisted the camera a bit. Yeah, so yeah. You can see the CDs, but not all the, yeah. you know, the books. Uh, <coughs> no, <coughs> So I was a prolific reader. I was never a good writer. Uh, <clears throat> when I was at uh, junior school, I was the only child in that school that was deemed to need extra help for lessons. Right. So while the other kids would write in, the other kids would go out and play football in the breaks, right. I would have to stay inside and do extra okay. work. All right. um, they believed at one point that I maybe had dyslexia and right. then realized that, no, it doesn't, it's just useless. You that just, was the thing you say. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I still have you know, great difficulty with uh, spelling and my handwriting is if anyone's ever seen my handwriting it's atrocious Mate, I, I might have a competition with you mine's really bad too. <laughs> <laughs> so I, i'm starting from a uh, a low base here it's not like it came naturally to yeah. me at all um i, I, I again i've got a big passion for the martial arts and decided one thing i wanted to do was was write a book 
I also had, um, they're actually just down here piled up as well, but I've got what I call my bunkai books, which yeah. are um, note papers, pad after pad after pad of thoughts, ideas, references, paragraphs, right. you know. So, and um, I, I'd kind of got a big pile of these and thought I should maybe try and bring this together in some kind of book. And this is in the, the kind of late 90s. Um, and it was a time where people would start to realize that, you know, grappling should be part of training as well. You see, you know, if you've got a striking base, you need a grappling backup. Yeah. Through the likes of, you know, um, Jeff Thompson was doing that and the MMA boom was convincing yeah, people. Yeah, MMA starting around that time. Was yeah, yeah. So, so, you know, people were starting to see that just being able to kick and punch wasn't enough. So I decided, okay, I'm going to write a book on the grappling methods. So in, I think it was October 2000 was when that book was um, published. But that's essentially all that was, was my my notes you know i just kind of rearranged it hmm. uh i bought a book on how to um approach publishers and, and that kind of thing so right. i learned how to lay it out so it looks professional and because they get you know the thing with publishers that people forget is they get you know, hundreds of applications every week yeah and so the ones that they're not going to read them all you know the, the, the most of them they'll look at and if it doesn't look right they'll throw so I, I, I was lucky enough that um when i submitted it it looked professional you right. know so the, it stood out from the crowd just by yeah. being put together. Because <laughs> if I'm doing it the right way, I'm not sending them the whole book. I'm sending them a few sample chapters. I'm sending them the synopsis. It's, right. it's all laid out as it should be. I'm, I've got a covering letter that tells them why I think it'll sell. Yeah. That's the other thing you, you know, people have to remember is publishers are in it to make money. Sure. So if, if you send them a book that you may think is fantastic, but they don't see a market for, it won't sell. Yeah, no one exactly. Will... It's the old question, is it, what's in it for them? You know, what... oh, absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, and, and publishing is an industry that's, you know, that's struggling at the minute with the likes of you know, uh, major publishers have gone bust. Um, it, 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 they, they need to watch the, the bottom line more than ever. You know? Yeah, I mean, uh, it's interesting. I was going uh, to maybe ask you a bit about um, you know, uh, digital publishing as well because that's something that's a lot more easily accessible to people. Now, I'm, I'm looking at, even though I'm terrible at writing, I'm looking at putting together a little book and, and um, it, it, it seems to be very easy to publish to Kindle and Amazon. I've not okay. done it yet, but it seems a lot more of a, a, short, a quicker shortcut. Well, well, that's the good thing is, um, so um, when, when I submitted the kind of the printed books, you have, you have that yeah. process of publisher will accept or reject. I've still got all the rejection letters. <laughs> Eventually you get it into print, but when you've got it into print, you, you know, it's, it's expensive. You've got all the printing problems. You've got storage issues. You've got distributors. Uh, the great thing about the um, digital is you cut out the middleman completely. Yeah. You can do it all independently. Yeah. So um, I, I, in the last 12 months, I put all five of my books onto Kindle. All right, okay. I was very surprised how easy that process was. You know, I paid someone to do it for me, but it yeah. didn't cost me much. And it was, yeah. it was to convert them into Kindle books. And they've sold um, pretty well. No, not as well as the people still seem to want the printed copy. Nice to just have something. Yeah, <laughs> and I kind of I get that. I've got my Kindle. I like my Kindle, yeah. but I also like Likewise, you know yeah. the real book. What yeah. I tend to do is I buy on uh, Kindle, and if I like the book, I'll buy a printed copy. Do you, do you know I've done exactly the same with a couple of things. It's like I've spent twice as much money now. <laughs> <laughs> and I guess um, I'm not. I know I'm not alone in this. I found that when you when the books go on the Kindle, it gives you the sale of your printed books a boost. Right. So um, there can be, but I think you know, in uh, like for example, the uh, the Bunkai Jitsu book is just I've just run out of stock. At the moment, I'm, I'm not overly minded to kind of reprint it. I'd rather use the money for new projects. You see, yeah. I mean, I, I, it'll be back in print at some point, but not just now. <clears throat> um, I've got other books on the go which have been on hold for quite a while because I've been you know waiting to the timing to be right. The great thing about the fact you can do it direct buy a kindle and things now is I, that's where i think i'll start yeah okay. it's no money up front you know what i mean it's, it's very accessible and, and easy for people it's it's that's yeah. that's kind of the future as i see it. yeah because I, I i was looking through on their um uh sort of guide to how to publish to the kindle store it's really simple you know it's a little bit of formatting and that kind of thing but basically if you've got word you can you can Oh, absolutely. Book onto Kindle, so you know. I think that's, if people watching this who've ever thought, oh, you know, it's really tricky to publish, and which the traditional way, you know, as you say, can be. But I think you know, if you if you want to just get it out there and see see get your thoughts out and get it done, you know, Kindle is the way forward. I think. 
Yeah, oh no, so it is. It's, I used um, to format it as well. I used uh, Elance. You know, the kind of it's a website that where you tender jobs and anyone in the world can. can... Elance. Elance. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. Fantastic site. Yeah, I use that for for quite a few things. It's where the the Marshallpreneur site was designed uh, from an Elance designer. Yeah, well, and it is. It's, it's a, well, and that's exactly how I just said. Okay, here's the print PDFs, the printing yep. PDFs. Make it into a Kindle. Yeah. And it came back, and it was very cheap. To yeah. do you know, yeah. compared to even like typesetting a printed book is is expensive. Right, right. But to get it done electronically is uh, an easier yeah. process. So there's tip one: get a, get a product, get your book out there, get on Kindle. Anyone's watching, if they've been procrastinating on it, just do no, it. That's something it. they can do. The one thing I would say to anyone writing books as well is, and I know anyone I've talked to who's written one of these, this is the thing that they didn't realise right. until <laughs> you've done it, right? And then everybody goes, that's it. So I finish my first book, I get printed, I get they get delivered, I've got a book, I'm an author, I'm a real author. Yep. Then you've got to sell it. Yep. Yeah, that's you know it. What I mean? <laughs> Otherwise, you've just got a big pile of books, you know yep. what I mean? So Absolutely. It, it's that that's where the hard work comes in is making sure that people are aware of that book that are aware of what information's in it aware of what it can give to them so that the writing it is a much easier process than the selling of it making it financially viable absolutely so yeah. do, do you think that's obviously it, it also affects isn't it with if you're looking to do classes looking to do seminars schools you know isn't it it's, it's all very well saying like, i've got this idea or i've made it and then like Right, I've got to tell everyone now. <laughs> so, so what, like, like, like you say, what, what, what were the, the sort of um, things that worked for you? What, what worked? Or... Well, well the, the, you're dead right there as well, because this, this is where I think, um, as martial artists have some very weird traits as a whole. Like we, do, <laughs> we are a weird bunch. <laughs> we are a weird group of people, right? <laughs> and I include myself in that, right? Yeah. So what, one of them is, is, is the weird ones is, um, uh, I, I know loads of people out there who are brilliant martial artists with fantastic material, the martial arts world would uh, would benefit hugely if these people would go public. But they have this strange idea of, I, oh, I can't be caught blowing my own trumpet. I don't want to be kind of promoting. I don't want to be a self-promoter. So what you have is you have these wonderful martial artists with fantastic things to offer stuck in a church hall that nobody knows about. <laughs> so the first thing that you've got to do is if, if you genuinely believe in your message and you hope that people aren't just writing or want to do seminars for, you know, the, the, they've got to believe they've got something to say. It's not just for... You know the, the ego of it, or or, or the, you know the, the or the, the, even the money of it. You've got to believe that the reason you're doing it is because you have something valuable to say. Yeah. And if you believe that, you the first thing you've got to get over is the reluctance. You've got to scream about what you do from the rooftops because nobody will do it for you. Yeah. No, people have this idea that people with high profile someday one guy knocked on the door and said, "Look, we we think you're brilliant. Do you want to do seminars? And do you want to write a book?" That, yeah wasn't it you know so I, I i've been accused and i know plenty of others <laughs> have been a relentless self-promoter i go great yeah fine, fine. <laughs> exactly. I, I can't afford to pay someone else to do it for me i yeah. believe what i do i've got to get it out there yeah, so. exactly yeah point the finger at the people that don't self-promote and are still famous <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, best look you know best look to them you know yeah, but, yeah exactly no no it's that's a good point and that sort of relates to the the podcast that i listened to that, that you did um, with uh, money in the martial arts and yeah. and there is with the martial arts world and, and I think we all know it is there's this weird stigma that being successful financially doing your martial arts relates to being a Mac Dojo or um, you're a scammer you know <laughs> or you know something negative where in in essence you know if you're you're making something that's good and helping people and in, like you say not just for the money and not just because you know you, you just want to boost your ego um, and you're creating something good then there's no shame in that, you know, and, and more power to you. Why why can't you do the things you love doing, you know? Uh, oh, absolutely, and living, also you know? with that as well, see, um, the market will decide. Hmm. So if, if what you're pumping out is, 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 is rubbish, no one will take any interest. No one will take any interest in your message. Um, you've, you've got to uh, have something of value, really, in order to get people. To, you can have the flashy website, you know, you can be relentless on social media, you can take out all the adverts. But ultimately, if what you've got beneath that has no substance, it'll never really get any traction. Yeah, sure. In the long term, it can in the short term, yeah. you know, but ne never in the long term. Yeah. And you're dead right, which is why I did the, the podcast. There's so many martial artists who um, are, uh, have this real problem with, with, with money. It's Because uh, there's two extremes. You can get the guy who is teaching bad quality martial arts, 
but as he's pretty good at marketing and therefore what he does is he promotes his bad quality martial art in order to make money. That's all he cares about. Yeah, yeah. At the other extreme, you've got the great martial artist who can't even keep the dojo lights on. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? There has to be some middle ground in there. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. In order to um, do what I do, I mean, and the vast majority of stuff I throw out there is for free. I don't charge for the podcast. The <laughs> website's free. The YouTube videos are free. Um, I couldn't do all of that unless I was able to keep the roof above my head through being able to make a decent living off the the other areas. Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. Yeah, uh, so that, that's, you know, people need to... And what happens is, because the good martial artists say, oh, I don't want to get involved with money, mm-hmm. it leaves the um, the McDojos, if you like, with all the cash, with all the financial muscle, yeah, to, yeah. and it, that, they've got that the damages the martial arts, yeah. yeah they've got the they dominate. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, you know, you, you sort of, you know, you're cutting your nose off despite your face, is the same. <laughs> so, uh, absolutely, and I, I can completely agree with that. And if anyone wants to check that out, I'll put a link to the podcast um, episode that, that you did oh, so they can you. listen to that because, you know, we could talk hours on that on that I think but you, you put it so right in that podcast it was it was great so I'll put a link uh, for our viewers to to listen to that um, but I mean sort of moving on from that so with with things like DVDs as well and training did that uh, offer the books as well did that something that came in after or before yeah or at the same no, time? it came in almost immediately after um, uh, one of my um, well, my main teacher for many many years was um, Doug James is eight down and he uh, used to run uh, video martial arts. They used to put like a, a quarterly video magazine out during the 1980s. And right. Then Duke produced uh, a lot of videos for people uh, like Wayne Otto and others. He'd, he'd done that. Um, and we were on our uh, summer course. This was not long after the winter course, I think it was. It was dark, so it must have yeah. been. <laughs> uh, and, uh, he'd mentioned to me about, you know, well done on the book kind of thing. And he said, uh, Have you thought about doing some videos to back it up? And obviously, as martial artists, I think. Theory comes across better in books. History right. comes across better in books. Technique comes across better on DVD where people can see it. So um, I did the first two uh, with with Doug through his kind of help and recommendation. And then from there, um, did some more. And then I did some with Summersdale. And now I do them all kind of in, in-house. But yeah, uh, sure. And they've proved to be, um, again, the lower cost to produce yeah. per unit. The, the big thing that people tend not to realize with DVDs is that if you want to make a good job of it, you have to um, pay professional people. Yep. So a lot of the martial arts DVDs out there, when I put them on, it's, a, okay, my mate's got a video camera, let's make a DVD. Yeah, yeah. And what happen, people won't rebuy. Really no matter how, much, how good the information is, if the sound's yep. bad and it looks cheap and tatty, people... It's not what you want. I think, yeah, I think, I think that I, I think you can make. I, I've done myself um, some some homemade stuff uh, uh, and videos that, that I've done, and but I think you can, you do need to rather than just having a camera and just forgetting about everything else, you do have to have that basics of, of lights and sound. I think oh, absolutely, is, yeah, is yeah. The, the biggest issue, you know, is and, and a lot of times you see people doing it, it looks like it's done in a basement, you know, there's no light, so you like, can't see it in there. You hear like um, uh, kids kind of jumping into swimming pools in the background yeah, or yeah, back that's, the roof. Or, that's right. But yeah. I mean, I think, you know, you can, you can, it can come across a lot more professional for a small investment, I think, on, onto, you know, um, home gear. I'm, I'm quite, I'm quite pro home recording and home publishing, but I, you do need to spend a little bit of money. And, and like you say, maybe get someone in who's done it before to help you. I think so. I mean, the, the one for me is I, I've always paid for uh, professional cameramen, professional sound men, professional editors, yeah. uh, professional directors. Um, for, for me, the, the one that's probably worth most of that is a director cause, because if people are good at teaching a class, teaching the camera, if you've never done it, people won't know this. You all know this if you've done it. But coming across well on camera is different. Yeah. So to have someone there who can uh, oversee things and Make sure that the cameras are right, the sounds are right. You're looking where you're supposed to look. That's that's invaluable. It it's, makes for a better quality product, I think. Absolutely. I mean, I, I I did a TV show recently for Loaded TV, and, and we worked on that. And it is a completely different world to even even like now, just talking to the yeah. you and the conversation when you've just got the red light and it's just on it. Just weird things happen. You just don't. You, <laughs> you, you just know. You just start saying stuff that you think, where, where did that come from? <laughs> But the the, um, the other thing is is that orga- I think the organisation of it, you know, to, to like say if you could get a producer or someone, even someone that can just correlate everything and make sure 
everyone's on track because you as the expert you can't be thinking about what's the next thing I have to do who's filming this oh. angle or what are we going to say next yeah it's too much you've got you've got too much going on so you need that person like as you say like get a, get a professional and helps massively you know oh, it does. And, then, and, and, and as you've said there it's pre, even if you, you decide that's not the route pre-plan it yeah. One of the best compliments I ever got was I was talking about um, one of my DVDs, you see, and, and the guy was saying, he says, there must be much, much quicker to produce than books. Yeah. So not really, because no, I'm really. a fast writer, but the DVD takes a lot of planning because, you know, you've got one day to get it right and you've yeah. got to get everything into one hour or, you know, two hours or whatever it is. Yeah. And he said, uh, he said, oh, really? Says, it always just seems like you just turned up and did it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it comes across that way. Yeah, exactly. Believe me, that's not what what happened yeah you know, at least you know it was, it was good enough to come out, you know. yeah i mean <laughs> I, I think it's um well with with filming with tv for people who watch a tv program normally a half an hour episode takes about a week to film so yeah. if you think about the amount of times you have to go over the same <laughs> stuff and do another angle and, uh, and and i think with films it's it's, it's incredible you know it's i think it's like a, a minute for a month's worth of filming you know it's, it's so yeah it's a lot more laborious video than um than than like, as you say i mean i've not done the books but it sounds you know i know video takes a long time <laughs> yeah it does absolutely yeah yeah, yeah. But, but well worth doing and again in this <laughs> um, digital age it's, i mean one thing that i've started doing as well as the physical dvds yeah is that uh, about two or three years ago i started making them available as downloads on the site right yep and now um the downloads are more popular than the dvds because it's immediate and instant yep and it's good for me because, like, every time someone orders, because I'm, you know, effectively a one-man band. Every time someone orders a DVD, then it needs put together, put in a box, sealed, Absolutely. take the, the post office, office posted. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. The great thing about the downloads, which is why you can sell them so much cheaper, really, is that yeah. um, there's the initial cost in filming them, recording them, hosting them. Mm. But after that, you know, it's just people click the button, they get what they want, and the website does the rest. You know. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. It's fantastic. I mean, <clears throat> and I think you know, things like. Yeah, I get, I get often get asked the questions like, oh yeah, but you can get that people can see that free on YouTube, you know that kind of thing. But you know, it, it really does. I, I did a DVD recently just on on a right cross, just knockout yeah. punch, right cross techniques. Really, really proud of it. But it didn't take me a huge time to film or anything. But um, I just did it as a tester. That's what yeah. I did, and um, just sold a few copies on eBay. And straight away, first week, one sold, and I was like. Amazing, you know. People actually, uh, everyone was saying, "No one will buy a DVD of the Right Cross." You know, no one will buy. I was like, "They really will." I said, and it wasn't that I was just trying to sell it, but you know, it was it was my method and the, that what I I felt was important about it. But um, yeah, it sold. So you know, that that sort of proved wrong the whole YouTube argument. I think. And the thing with with I mean, I use YouTube a lot. You know, it's um, YouTube has been a, a very successful way of getting my message out. I've got yeah. over. I think it's about five or hours worth of free material on YouTube now, and I'm yeah. constantly I'm just it's there. It's my little bloggy camera. Hey. <laughs> but yeah, I, t I take that everywhere with me, and then if yeah. I'm teaching a seminar, I think people might find this interesting. I, I do it, but the material that's uh, on the DVDs, um, which has been professionally filmed and recorded, um, then obviously I, I need income for that to keep everything going and to pay for the cost of producing it. So I'm there, none of that finds its way onto YouTube, and then you're involved in the kind of constant. Um, kind of anti-piracy battles as well, yeah. you see. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, unfortunately, some people believe that it, it's totally okay. If it's digital, you can steal it. <laughs> yes. Yeah, you can't. That's another weird thing that's crept in with the digital <laughs> isn't it? So, oh, it's digital. Oh, I just nick that. <laughs> yeah. but, I, but I've got to be honest, one of the things that, I, I, that always warms my heart, really, is for the amount of downloads I, I sell, mm -hmm. uh, I've, comparatively rarely do I find my material made available freely online. So, yeah. The people that are buying it um, uh, are obviously valued enough to say, "Okay, we like what he's doing. We understand he needs to make a living. Yeah. We're not going to kind of, you know, I like your material, but I'll stab you in the back, kind of thing." Yeah, but yeah. I do get some. I like. I, I remember I got a a guy ordered a few DVDs from me, and then he was just saying, "You know, reason for ordering. I want to complete my collection because these are the ones I can't download for free online." <laughs> right. So, and he was very shocked that I wouldn't give him the DVD. <laughs> you know, I wrote to yeah. him because you're stealing from yeah. me. You are stealing and he, from. He's actually making. Well, I've got to buy these, but I'm not happy about <laughs> it because I stole the others. <laughs> so was, uh, remarkable. So, yeah. So, uh, so that's, I guess that's you know the negative of, of, of digital. But the great thing is, you know, you stick something up on YouTube, yeah. and if you label it right and you get the right keywords in and code words, and I was given some help with that. Yeah. Um. Uh, my if you type Katabunkai into Google, for example, my YouTube channel is number one. 
So if people want to learn Count the Bunk Guy, they're going to hit me first. Yeah. And then because I've put all that free stuff on there, and every single one of them has my web address on it. Yeah. Now, I'd be a rich man if, if I got a penny for every view. You know, that would do me. But there's only a very small percentage you actually kind of end up purchasing. Yeah. But it's enough to keep the whole thing going, you yeah, see. Yeah, absolutely. So if people are using YouTube, that's another one I'd, I'd strongly recommend that, you know, people to do that because it's, yeah. it's such an effective yeah. tool. Uh, and that, get that, that's fantastic. Yeah, I mean, it, it, and again, it's a free tool. You know, you don't, yeah. there's no investment involved there. You can just sign up for a Google account and get your YouTube channel going. And even, my, my thing is, even if what you put out is rubbish, you could, like, as in not in content-wise, but the production-wise, um, and you haven't got any special equipment at least you're getting practice in aren't you it's um oh, you know, yeah, yeah. And, and it's sort of uh you know i think it's a good little stomping ground to just sort of hone your hone your uh, marketing skills really and uh, practice talking in front of the camera and that kind of thing and i, I know as well that the, the common misconception as well is that you put a video on youtube and suddenly everyone in the world's going to be watching you and <laughs> take the mic but really you know a lot of the time videos don't get a huge amount of <laughs> the views and you'll never hear from anyone about it but <laughs> well, uh, no no that's that, that's it well the, this um um little tricks that i was given like uh, whatever you want people to search put in the title of your video yeah. make sure those words are mentioned a couple of times in the content yeah um uh, your link to your website it needs a http otherwise uh, um uh, YouTube won't make it live, so it's HTTP dot, and that's the very first line, you see. Yep. Now, these were little things that I got. So if anyone looks at my videos, I could have done it under the name Ian Abernethy, but if they're doing that, they already know me. Yep. So I don't need to get through to those people. They already know I exist. So every single one of my videos starts with Practical Got a Bunk Eye, call on, whatever the title, Practical Got a Bunk Eye, Kashanko application, yeah. practical kind of bunk guy, pad drill. So it's the, the, the subject matter. And, and, is there, so yeah. then you're easy to find through that. So, for example, if someone had made a video on right cross, yeah. you know, yeah. then, then what they want to be doing is it wants to be the title of that video, wants to be right cross instruction. Yeah. You Absolutely. know what I mean? So, yeah. you know, because it, it, it's little things like that, because one of the problems that, that people can also have in the digital age is you can get drowned out by the noise. So you, mm -hmm. you've got to do something to, to get above the. <laughs> what everyone else is doing so people kind of find you, you know? absolutely that's great great tips there Ian that's great tips um, so yeah I mean what we talked about we've got on from books we're on videos <laughs> what would be let's let's take it back a little bit how would you because um, it can be quite overwhelming some, sometimes you know and I know I've seen things on sort of how to and, and get guides and tips and stuff and, and just Really, what's what would be the essence for you, Ian? If you could um, talk to you when you first started making the leap to full time, what would yeah. be your tips now to you, and would you how would you sort of summarise that for for you as a guide? Um, if I'm honest, what what I did, what I think was the right thing to do. So if I was talking to me back then, I'd say keep doing it yep. because it, it worked. It worked, yeah, exactly. it, it worked. Whatever yep. you, you know, you maybe made a few mistakes, but it worked. But the, the, I mean, some. Uh, one is, you know, people can't expect things to land in the lap. That's that's not going to happen. If you want a high profile, you're the person who's going to have to generate it. Mm -hmm. The second thing is, is to be absolutely relentless with it. And even if it seems that you get nowhere, you are. Yeah. So every every article that you write, every blog post that you make, every video that you, you put up, every tweet that you send out, everything you do is, is, is helping. And I always like, I refer to like um, Jeff Thompson had this lovely phrase where he says, you can look at a tree and it looks like it's still. He says, but it's grown right in front of your eyes, you know. Yeah, and, 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 and that's, the, the, I think the main thing is to concentrate on the process. Yeah. You know, what can I do to, to get my message out? To, to, um, um, and what can I do to improve what I do, you know, but just keep chipping away at it. Be absolutely relentless with it. Yeah. And don't get disheartened if, you know, you put one YouTube video up and no one's banging on your door asking for seminars. It's not the way it works. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You need to think of, well, where do I want to be in five years? You know, and I'm yeah. going to slowly chip away towards that. So when I was 16, I knew what I wanted to do. And mm -hmm. I, I slowly kind of worked um, away at that. And that, that's what I would advise just get anyone. That, just get you can goal do it. clearly defined, yeah. Yeah, clearly define it and just every single what, – what I did as well, this might help people, is uh, when I uh, started out and the, um, the money was kind of really not there and I'm starting to – when I have those days of doubts, what I did, I had a, um, a notebook and every day in that notebook I would write down what I'd done that day to further my goal. Right, you know what I mean, of being uh, able to be a full-time martial artist. Now, that could be sims that, well, I answered emails. 
Yeah. You know, something as simple as that. I yeah. I, um, I put a, a forum post up. I trained. Um, you know, I've made some phone call. I write it down because it just reminds you that you, you're doing the the right things. And although the, the the fruit of that might not have appeared yet, it will. It, it can't not. Yeah. If you if you keep chipping away at the process, it'll it'll happen. So that, that's it's what like, I would invite people to do. Those sort of small daily increments, isn't it? Uh, you know, and it all builds up to that that final well, point. I, yeah. it, it, that's exactly right. Same and, as and, training. Same as training, isn't it? Is it? And then the, 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 you, <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then the thing is, martial artists, we get that. Yeah. No one walks in the dojo, and then the day later, they're, well, they could in some dojo. No one walks <laughs> in the, dojo, and the day later, they're a black belt. That, that's not yeah. the way it works. So it, yeah. it's it's constant little increments. So yeah. no, no fast fix. Just keep doing yeah. the right thing over and over and over. And and uh, I, I'm big with sort of um, you know the the. The fear of failing and and sort of you know you, you need to in my opinion same as same as training again you know you need to do things wrong once to work out or a couple of times to work out how to do it properly you know that's <laughs> just how yeah. you learn you know and in my opinion that's very true and um i don't know about yourself is there been any times where you've just completely cocked it up and thought hang on a minute this is not working and oh how, yeah, yeah. That affected things yeah no, no, yeah, you do it all the time. I yeah. mean, it, it, like, a common with everything I do, it's like that. So every article that people see, mm. right, that, that's been messed up when it was written and has been rewritten. Every <laughs> podcast that people hear, right, as, as sometimes it just works on the first go, but most uh, I've had to go back through, I've had to edit it. That doesn't sound right. I've had to take yeah. out all the errs and ums and errs uh, <laughs> and ums. Yeah. When I messed my, lost my train of thought, you know. Um, <laughs> My granddad had a lovely phrase. He was a, a, a joiner, a carpenter. So he said, whenever he goes into someone's house, you know, the first thing he does is turn the house upside down. And when it's finished, it looks nice. So he always used to tell people, you know, if you want me to make a chest of drawers or a doorway, the first thing I've got to make is the mess. Right. <laughs> I, mean, I always like that. So that's, that's always really nice. If I want to make something, the first thing I've got to make is the mess. The mess. That's so really so good. whenever I'm looking at scrumpled up piles of paper and, the, you know, the kind of, you know, I just think, okay, I've made the mess. Yeah. <laughs> I'll have to remember that for the missus. Yeah, yeah. I can now now get on with it, and, and yeah. it's not being afraid to do that either. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, I've made you know. I think one of the like big mistakes is uh, I was very late in picking up things like social media. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I had my website. My website was relatively successful, and then people were saying you should be on Facebook and Twitter. And I'm like, ah, I don't want to. Oh, yeah. Uh, I, I can't, you know, and what a mistake that was. Because yeah, as soon yeah. as I've got into it, I really enjoy it, and it's a very effective way of kind of keeping engaged with people and and getting the message out. So that was one error I definitely made. I should have done that two or three years ago before I actually got round to it. Yeah, absolutely. And and I mean, I also think as well that sometimes um, you can um, try and force yourself down a path. I mean, I never, when I first started martial arts, I mean, I never thought about doing a, a, an interview show for like, <laughs> you know. <laughs> interviewing experts and guests for uh, talking about martial arts business but um, I think there's also some people forget that there's other ways to turn it into a living for still living your, your passion okay. um, and like yourself I mean like you say you, you don't necessarily run a traditional dojo um, but you do seminars you've got your books DVDs um, so I, I don't know you have any thoughts on that you know yeah, yeah. well I, um, I do have a dojo uh, it's the same place I've taught in for 25 years yeah. And I, I have probably about 20 students, right? which is why I like it, because that, that, that's kind of me and my friends get together and we train and we swap ideas and we have fun. Yeah. So the, the club actually um, cost me money. So as, as a, as a yeah. you know, and I know so people... When I, when I said like, no, as a purpose dojo, as in like you don't have like a chain or, you know... That, 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 that's exactly right, yeah. That, that's, I understood what you meant. I just wanted oh, to... Sorry, yeah, in case others didn't, yeah. So I, I don't have a, um, like you say, I don't have a chain. I don't have a... Um, uh, a wide range of association or anything like that. Yeah. Uh, what I do have is, like, say, um, and the reason I didn't want that is, uh, for a time, I did teach uh, most evenings, mm -hmm. and it, and it wasn't for me. I, I found that the needing to be at the dojo at certain times was starting to rob the fun of it a bit for me. So yeah. I, yeah. I, I scaled that back. I love traveling and doing the seminars. Love meeting new people. Love having fun with people who share my passions. Great. Absolutely. I like producing like the podcast the dvds and stuff because people seem to like them and it's fun to do so what I, that was um how i make my living from it which i get unusual now a friend of mine went on a, he went on a martial arts uh, seminar on you know how to make um your dojo successful and they went through all the different ways in which you could monetize the martial art you see and the guy said and finally he says we have the ian abernethy approach and <laughs> right. he it. And, and I says, really? He said, yes, yeah. so I feel like I should go on that course because I wasn't fully aware that I had no problem. Yeah. <laughs> it seems like that's, some, that's something I should really have learned myself. But yeah. 
Um, yeah, but I've been able to. The, the, yeah. the combination of um, seminars and, and the, the products um, enables me to, to make enough money to enable me to keep doing what I love. Yeah. And, and, and as we said, that's the important thing for me. Um, so long as my bank balance is such I don't need to worry about it, mm. I'm happy mm. with it. It's actually, you know, if it's, 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 uh, it's not always about, and, and I think people assume, I'm not going to ask about how much or anything like that, but I think um, everyone always assumes that you need to be like making millions or something to ha enjoy your lifestyle. And, and really, it's, it's just, it's enough to pay for what you need to pay for, isn't it? I mean, Absolutely, a lot of people try yeah. and think about, oh, well, I've got to make a hundred thousand or you know, <laughs> a million a week or something. And they assume when you say, you know, you make w enough to cover your lifestyle. That could be, you know, a couple of grand, you know, less than that for some people. If you're a yeah, yeah. single guy on your own, I remember I used to get by at about £250 when I was at college. <laughs> <laughs> that was a lot for the year. <laughs> well, and that's, but, yeah. that, that's it, you know, I, I, my, my um, lifestyle's pretty lean. I'm not a great one for socialising. I don't need to holiday because I get to see the world seminar in. Yeah. Um, and there's enough that comes in from there to kind of maintain that. My children want for nothing. Yeah. I'm happy. Absolutely. And I get to do what I love doing. Hmm. And, and I'd rather do that than die, you know, with yeah. you know, with what I've got in the bank as opposed to dying with millions and I've hated everything. I, I could have made more in my old job. I could have made a lot more. But I didn't like it. It wasn't where my passion was. So and, you know. and then there's always things in stress and all the rest of it and you become sick and yeah, I hear so much nowadays, you know, people doing jobs just because it's got to pay the bills, not because they wanna do it. And I've been yeah. there, I've been in work that I just didn't want to do and it, it does it just brings you down, you know, and it, you can't live your life like that. It's it's um I think it is uh, important for people to at least take stock of what they do like doing, you know. Absolutely, yeah. For, for, and for, for those everyone. that have that, absolutely. For those yeah. that have that um, great passion for the martial arts, that great enthusiasm, yeah. it, it comes across. And, and then you can share that with people. You you add enjoyment to other people's lives. You enjoy your own life a little bit more and everybody wins. Yeah. But, you know, you need to make money to do that. And as I mentioned in the podcast and as we've touched on, some yeah. martial arts have a big problem with that and yeah. they need to get over it. Yeah, and, and, and like I said, like as we touched on there as well, is that, <clears throat> in my personal opinion, there's there's other avenues and there's things like you could... Um, I think there's a huge scope for someone to do a show like this, but just for, like, say, for Carter, you know? Yeah, yeah, absolutely, and, yeah, yeah. And, and, and to, you know, um, as you do with the, the your podcast, which is audio, which is the same kind of thing. Um, and just all the, all, the thing, all the different martial arts out there, you know, Salat, Kung Fu, Karate, um, Jiu Jitsu... BJJ, you could do a great show. I'd love to see someone do a show like this and, and just get a guest on, a special specialist from their art, and Absolutely. talk about that art for for an hour. You know. <laughs> well, and that's you know, and, and the, the, the the martial arts are so diverse. There's so <laughs> many different parts of it, different styles, different approaches. There's so much that, that, that can be done with it. Yeah. Um, and and again, there's bound to be someone listening to this thinking, "Oh, what I'd really like is well, maybe you're the guy to do it." Yeah, exactly. You know, what I mean, you're, yeah. you're the guy to do it. You know, don't sit around waiting for someone else to do it because they're all waiting for you to yeah. do it. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. There you go. There you go. And you know, things like um, uh, you know, selling martial arts equipment. Maybe you can make. You know, I know a, a friend of mine is one of our guests. He makes custom gis. You know, one of his yeah. companies, and uh, yeah, really cool looking custom gis for tournaments and stuff. You know, <laughs> awesome idea. You know, there's so many different avenues that you can take that passion. It just doesn't have to always be teaching, you know? No, no, absolutely. especially in this um, global age. Yeah. Where, whereas, you know, every single one of us at the click of a mouse can hit, reach the entire world. Now, pre-internet, I couldn't do what I'm doing. Yeah, a lot you, harder. You know, yeah. The, 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 it, it's a fact that I can reach a worldwide audience that means I can travel worldwide, you see. But now, yeah. now everyone's got that. Yeah. You know, yeah. using the, that kind of medium to connect with people. Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. And even if you've got, like I have, I mean, Katabunka is, it's not, you know, it's a minority interest. Yeah. It's, There's it's, enough people worldwide who have that minority interest that yeah. make it kind of, you know, yeah. viable yeah. when we viable. come to get to the group, yeah. Absolutely, you know. And I think if you look, um, if you study like other internet um, areas where people have um, made their, their income online or, or, or even not just online but offline as well and, um, it is that thing they can go into really minute subjects, you know, <laughs> that are crazy what some people are obsessed with oh, know, yeah, and yeah. want more information <laughs> and want someone to be able to show them how to do stuff. It's crazy. I think one of the top internet search terms is like how to boil an egg, you know, it's like, <laughs> do you know what I mean? And, and those sorts of websites have like huge hits and follows. It can be something really crazy. I mean, just not, you know, off the subject of martial arts, just. You know, as long as you've got oh, yeah. um, skill and knowledge or passion in something, you can, um, no matter how 
um, silly it seems. If there's enough people together that like doing it, you know, go and go and make your little group. <laughs> I remember reading um, an article. It was actually one that Jeff Thompson sent me. I can't remember which newspaper it was from. Right. It was saying that a band, you know, in the, in the past, like a band, music band, right? Yeah. They needed like a record label and everything else. Yeah. The, the, the article was saying that with a thousand followers, so a thousand people who like this band, that band can, so four members of a thousand followers should be out enough to, to remain viable. Yeah. And then it meant through things like murchis, murchising, downloads, concerts, and all of the stuff you said, from a yeah. thousand people. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, and that's not a lot of people, you know, is it when you're hitting <clears throat> worldwide, you know. Um, so there's, there's no reason, if, if you've got that minority interest, yeah. you could still share that with those people who share that passion yeah. and yeah. enable yourself to really devote to it by generating enough money to keep yourself afloat, you know. Yeah, exactly. And you think, you know, think how, how great, you know, with Marshallpreneur at, at the moment, TV, you know, I'd like to see that in the future. I'm looking at um, sponsors and, and people to come on board for the show yeah. um, to, to bring some income in for the show. And, and, you know, I've got so many ideas that if, if this goes <laughs> enough to, for me viable to spend all my, all my time on it, yeah. You know, I can do some amazing things, and it's just. But like you say, it just takes step by step. You know, every every day you just do a little bit, and I'll yeah, get yeah. there. You know, I'll get there with Marshallpreneur TV, and then I really will annoy all you guys every week. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I mean, that's been fantastic, Ian. Um, f- thank you for for bringing your thoughts in on that. I do have a question for you, um, which came in. And, and by the way, if anyone has any questions about this episode, and and and, and Ian, I'm sure you'd be happy to answer them if anyone sends in their uh, questions for you. Absolutely, um, yeah. I love it. But I've got a question we sent in. I sent out to our our, um, our uh, VIP newsletter list uh, <laughs> last night, so that it was a bit last minute. I said, I've got Ian on the show. Um, has anyone got any questions? So I got a martial artsy one. That wasn't a, a business one, but it was to do with uh, Carter. And it was from actually from one of our guests, Richard Grannon, uh, yeah. from Street Fight Secrets. And uh, he said, uh, I have a question for Ian. Do we see any applications of the trusty headbutt, eye gouge, or C-grip in the Carter applications? Yeah, all, all, all of that's in there. Really? The, um, yeah, the, 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 if you look back at some of the old texts, this head, when people forget this. People that go dirty techniques. Like in Karate Do Your Han, Funakoshi talks about spitting on the enemy and, you know, there's all this, you know, the, and I've never seen that yet. I've seen people practice punching the dojo. I've never seen anyone practice spitting, you know. <laughs> anyone feel a grading because the spitting wasn't good that, enough. That would be an interesting drill, <laughs> though, Ian. That would be an interesting to get everyone lined up outside. Next to the <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like the Babishi shows um, headbutting techniques. His headbutting techniques in Kata. Kura Rumpf is a, a classic example where there's a reverse headbutt found, found in there. Right. Um, there's a lot of techniques in kata that flow off um, the wrist being seized, uh, which people often tend to view as guy walks up and grabs your wrist. Well, but you stick your thumb in somebody's eye, he'll grab your wrist. You try and hit him in the groin, he'll grab his arm. You yeah. try and keep him away, he'll grip your wrist to pull it down. So yeah. there's lots of reasons why these wrist grabs happen, and one of those is you know the kind of throat grabbing and the eye gouging. Yeah. Um, their flow offs, their responses from them. Yeah. So. Uh, all, all of that's within the um, within the the forms. Yeah, know. yeah, absolutely. It's, Good pretty, stuff. I mean, that's what I love. I love the, the yin yang of kata. You watch a beautifully performed kata, and you it's 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 beautiful and graceful, and you're in awe at the beauty of it. Then you look at the bunkai, and it's dirty, horrible, it's horrible, <laughs> horrible, horrible. Yeah, yeah there's that lovely yin yang thing which I, I appeals to me. So, yeah, yeah, it's all there. Yeah. Absolutely, oh, brilliant. He also said um, he also put a remark there. He said he was training with someone at a. Uh, uh, that was training with him who had been to one of your seminars the, the day before and um, he said that um, this guy remarked he said it's, it's spookily similar material in similar <laughs> ways <laughs> but, but see, that's a funny thing see I, I, um, when if I'm asked to teach a non-karate group yeah. I teach them the exact same thing I just make no reference to the kata yeah. when Literally. I teach the karate guys I go here it is and this is how the kata records it but it's yeah. the same stuff and the weird thing is I sometimes find I've got a lot more in common with the reality-based kind of guys who yeah. don't do kata, than the traditionalists who do do kata but never consider its application. Absolutely, yeah. You know I and mean? so it's it's funny once you get into what works, we all start coming together. That you know, there's there's only so much you know that works, and there's only so much that only so many ways the human body can kind of interact. Absolutely, you know? and, and violence has always been the same, hasn't it? You know, it's uh, you know people. Going toe to toe has always been the same. <laughs> I mean, the, 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 the laws will change, yeah. and the weapons used may change. But in terms of you know the, the human body and the way its emotions and the way it acts in conflict, that's you know been the same for thousands of years. You yeah, know, so. absolutely. 
It's not going to radically change overnight unless we grow a third arm or something. Yeah, <laughs> which might happen <laughs> soon with all things going on in the world. <laughs> anyway, Ian, that's, that's been fantastic. Thank you very much for coming on the show. Oh, my um, pleasure, Scott. Enjoyed it. Appreciate it. And um, where, can, where can we find more out, uh, about you, Ian? Uh, IanAbernethy.com is probably the place to go to. So it's um, I-A-I-N, which is the Scottish spelling of Ian. I, I had a, a Scottish grandmother who was fiercely proud of being Scottish. Yeah. So no way she was having a first grandson having an English name, right? So, yeah. so it's uh, um, Ian spelt the Scottish way, Abernethy.com. Yeah. So you spend all your time correcting people on insurance quotes, <laughs> forms. <laughs> well, I have it now. It's always, what's your name? Yeah. Ian Abernethy. I, 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 I yeah, yeah, you start to say that. Uh, the same with Patterson. It's two T's in the normal, the, the common spelling, and mine's the one T Scottish spelling, not the Irish, so... Yeah. <laughs> anyway, I'll um, I'll wrap up and thank you again, Ian. It's been a pleasure, and uh, yeah, hope to have you back on the show sometime if you ever want to come on. Yeah, the show. Brilliant. Thank, thank you. you very much.